Kenneth O'Keefe served as a U.S. Marine, but after being discharged, he was left with only a feeling of disappointment. He burned his U.S. passport and dedicated himself to a different cause. His rich activist biography includes being a human shield in Iraq, sailing on a Gaza flotilla, protecting marine life in Hawaii, and helping establish dialogue with Iran. And he is our guest today. As a Marine, Kenneth O'Keefe fought against Iraq. It shattered his view of the world. Ever since, he has been fighting a war against war, facing American bombs as a human shield or running the Gaza blockade. He is never afraid to speak truth to power. But what makes him take up action for others? So I'm here with activist Kenneth O'Keefe. It's really great to have you on our show. Kenneth, I know that you've led a human shield action in Iraq right before the war started and then you were deported. Why do you think the removal of Saddam hasn't improved the lives of Iraqis? Or has it? I don't know. Well, I think if you really want to know the truth about the invasion of Iraq, there's clearly some incentives for the invasion. Oil, securing oil was one of them. Establishing permanent military bases in the region was another one. But a far less talked about reality is Israeli plans, which made clear that the balkanization of surrounding countries, in particular Iraq, if we go to Odid Yanan's plan for Israel in the 1980s, it lays out very clearly a strategy of destabilizing all of the surrounding areas of Israel. This includes Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and even Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And this long-term goal is part of the Greater Israel Project. So, in terms of the sectarian divide you see happening in Iraq today, it's actually all part of a very well-designed plan to try and secure the goal, this fantasy goal of the Greater Israel Project. Okay, but why would Israel benefit from an unstable Middle East, an unstable Arab nations? Because what we see that this instability actually is followed by fundamental Islam and people who are well, overthrown indeed, yes. are either replaced by fundamentalist powers or there's just more sectarian violence that grows. Yes, and it would seem on the surface from a sane point of view that everything is going wrong. But in fact, when you fracture a country along sectarian divide, ultimately you weaken the country. What the, the last thing that Israel or the United States wants is a strong Nasser-type leader, a, an Arab nationalist who will seriously ensure that the resources of that country are taken and protected and used for the benefit of the people. That's the last thing that the empire wants and that Israel wants. So while you have these religious fundamentalist nutcases who are running around bombing and doing all sorts of stuff like that, you have a weakened, fractured country in Iraq. And that is the prerequisite for ultimately expanding Israel into the fantasy of the Greater Israel Project. It doesn't seem sane, and it's not sane, because those who are trying to carry out these agendas are pure and simple psychopaths. And so you think that American administrations, one after another, have been following this plan for 30 years? If you ask me how the world functions, then you have to understand one thing plain and simple. The head of the snake, the system of power, is headed by the financial system. The bankers rule the earth through the private control of the issuance of money, debt-based money, which we're all supposed to pay, ultimately with all of these things that they call austerity and whatnot. The bankers basically, through the control of the issuance of money, which allows them to provide themselves with an infinite supply of money, means they can buy anything and anyone that can be bought. So when we look at the vast majority of governments around the world, there are nothing more than puppets who are carrying out an agenda for the bankers. And the bankers at the top of this pyramid are, as I've said, plain and simple psychopaths. They're drunk on their own power. They're used to getting everything they want. They can buy anything and anyone that can be bought. And this explains the corruption of virtually every government we can look at. And the policies do not reflect the interests of the people. They reflect pure and simple the interests of the bankers. But Kenneth, if what you're saying is true, that governments obey the big banks and the big money, then it would really take the people and revolution in each country that you have named to actually change things around. Do you really see revolution taking place in America, for example? Well, it's already happening. I'll give you a great example of why I'm optimistic about things in America. You know the President of the United States, traitor that he is, is actually a constitutional lawyer. 
He's actually trained at the highest levels of university in constitutional law. Do you know how obscene it is that somebody who is trained in constitutional law, giving himself the authority to execute anyone, anywhere, at any part of the planet with no jury, no trial, no conviction, no nothing. This man is a dictator who has assigned himself the right to execute anyone, including U.S. citizens. I am confident that at some point the American patriots who seem to be in a bit of a coma and have been sleeping for a long time are going to wake up soon and realize that while they took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, the President of the United States also took that oath and has breached it so badly that he should be arrested and charged with treason right now. And ultimately, all of the sycophants in the U.S. Congress who passed things like the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act, again, completely contrary to the U.S. Constitution, which is supposed to be the supreme law of the land, these people need to be arrested. And a government needs to be put in place that actually honors the U.S. Constitution. And I honestly believe that's going to happen one way or the other. But it's going to happen. But you just started your answer by saying that the revolution is already happening. So where is the revolution that you're talking about? I'll tell you what, it, it, this is another thing that really excites me, uh, Sophie, because while you're not seeing it, apparently, and many other people may not be seeing it, let me give you a perfect example where the revolution has already occurred. And the first step of that revolution is awareness. No one is more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. The people of the world are starting to realize that they have been enslaved, enslaved in a financial system which is effectively selling the future of their children down the river. And more and more people are becoming aware of that. They're also sick and tired of being lied to about one boogeyman after another. And ultimately, what happened in Syria, this is a key point, and I really want to make this point before we move on to the next one, because it's talking about the revolution that you're referring to. The reason why we did not hit Syria, the reason why we did not start bombing Syria, is a one simple thing, and that is that the people of the West and the world simply did not buy it. They didn't have to go on the street and protest. Keep in mind, back in 2003, we had the largest protest in the history of the world, did not stop the invasion of Iraq. But I'm telling you, the invasion and the occupation and ultimately the bombardment of Syria has been planned long ago. It's a stepping stone towards Iran, which is the ultimate goal for these psychopaths, and they could not bombard Syria, and the reason why they couldn't even vote to secure that a vote to favor that here in Britain is because the people overwhelmingly did not buy it. In the United States, the approval for bombardment of Syria was about 9%. That's why the U.S. Congress, which is a treasonous body of government, couldn't even go to a vote on it. Because if they went to a vote on it and actually voted for another war and this farcical war on terror, where the fantastic American servicemen took pictures of themselves saying, I did not join the U.S. military to fight with al-Qaeda in Syria, says it all. If they had made that move, there would have been an open revolution. The powers that be know that the people are primed and ready to take major steps to stop this. And again, American patriots are going to go into the Congress and the White House eventually and arrest these cowards and trees and traitors. But it's under the surface right now. It's getting ready. And to show the power of the people, ultimately, we did not go into Syria. This is because the people did not provide the one key element for the powers that be, and that is their consent. If they don't have our consent, they can't do a damn thing. The point that I'm making is that the U.S. president has given himself the authority to execute anyone, anywhere, anytime, for any pretext, any bogus reason. Is, is that more of a problem to the world than Bashar al-Assad? Of course it is. It's much more of a problem that the President of the United States says he can execute anyone, anywhere, anytime. And yet we're sitting here talking about Bashar al-Assad, which, granted, this man has committed crimes in Syria. There's no question of that. But when we look at the U.S. President, when we look at Israel, when we look at the, the Britain, uh, this alliance, this true axis of evil between these three countries, the amount of devastation that has occurred in Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of the world, Yemen, Pakistan, is so devastating, I think it's beggar's belief that we as people can be conned into thinking that Bashar al-Assad is the problem, or that Ahmadinejad was the problem. We are the problem. We in the West are the problem, especially the United States government. So it really is quite ridiculous that we get manipulated into saying, oh, we have to take care of this problem over there. The problem is in our own backyard. And we know this. We've got to take care of our dirty, filthy house of corruption. The United States Congress is nothing but a den of traitors, the most sycophantic, disgusting traitors you can imagine. And the White House has got a dictator. This is a problem. This is a major problem, much bigger problem than what's happening in Syria with Bashar al-Assad. Now, you have great knowledge and strong opinions about events in the Middle East. Iran has recently softened its attitude towards its opponent after decades of deadlock. Israel is annoyed. And how do you see that developing? 
I think it's a reflection of the sanity of the people around the world who realize that any kind of attack on Iran is tantamount to initiating a full-scale third world war, which of course could very well and inevitably would lead to a war with China and Russia. This is pure madness. And those of us who've lost loved ones or who have served in combat, like myself, and others who know the devastating cost of war, not just for the so-called victor, because the only victor really is the bankers, quite frankly. But even those who supposedly on the winning side suffer greatly. And testimony to that fact, aside from the million to two million dead in Iraq, is the 22 American servicemen a day who are committing suicide because of the horrendous things that they were called to do in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. So this policy now, this shift in policy to actually resolve this conflict with Iran, this false conflict in truth, is a reflection of the will of the people, if you ask me which is starting to achieve the goal. So you think Netanyahu is bluffing? Because I've spoken to a couple of Israeli well, parliamentarians, I've spoken to Israelis, and they're all for a strike. Yes, yes. No, I, I, I don't think that he's bluffing. He's an absolute psychopath. And he reflects the agenda for the powers that be in Israel. Each one of these players, Netanyahu, George Bush, Obama, uh, you know, Cameron, they're all puppets, and they're all supposed to read a different script at different times, depending on what the agenda is. The agenda is shifting slightly, and it looks like Israel and the people of Israel, the Jewish state of Israel, are like sheep being led to slaughter because ultimately the policies of Israel are completely and totally unsustainable. Even the CIA said in 2009 that Israel would not, be any, would not even exist within 20 years. Henry Kissinger himself said it wouldn't exist within 10 years, and the reason why is because its policies are totally self-destructive, and the puppet masters are quite happy to sacrifice the people of Israel. They're going to destroy themselves if they do attack Iran, because Iran can fight back and does have allies, and a lot of countries are sick and tired of Israel's threats to both its immediate neighbors and even to the rest of the world. When we look at the Samson option, I encourage people to Google Samson option and look at the threat that Israel is posed to the world if things don't go its way. Mm -hmm. But well, when you talk about the United States, the United States is Israel's main supporter, but right now we see that it's kind of open to Iran as well, knowing how much anxiety that raises among Israelis. What does it tell you about the U.S.? It tells me that the, the people are beginning to realize their power. I think there's things that correlate. The approval rating for Barack Obama in the U.S. Congress is about as low as it's possible to get, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 percent, 20 percent maximum. The people have come to a point where they are sick and tired of being lied to. They know they're being lied to. And when they see their so-called leaders trying to cooperate with Israel in yet another war that would lead to disastrous consequences for the region and for the United States and every other person involved, they've had it. And the reflection of the policies is indeed that of the people. It's the people who are sick and tired. And I do see that there is some demarcation going on here between Israel and the United States. But this is because the power of the people is rising. And as we saw in Syria, the Congress and the president was all basically saying the red line was crossed, blah, 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 blah. And this blatantly false flag attack in Ghouta in Syria has backfired. They were not able to carry out this agenda. And this is only empowering the people that much further. Mm -hmm. So you think Iran should be allowed to develop its nuclear program? I think it's absolutely hypocritical and insane that we would sit here and fixate on Iran and its supposed nuclear weapons program, which I don't believe exists. But nonetheless, who could blame Iran if they were developing a nuclear weapon? If the United States and the West taught any lesson to the rest of the world with the invasion and occupation of Iraq, it was that Saddam Hussein was a fool for actually disarming, because by disarming, all he did was make it that much easier for the empire to come in and destroy the entire country. So the lesson we teach to the world is that the best way to defend yourself is to get yourself a nuclear weapon. And of course, the biggest culprit of using nuclear weapons and producing nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction is my birth nation of the United States and I find it absolutely insane that we sit here and talk about Iran's supposed nuclear weapons program when we know the United States is producing every kind of weapon under the sun is spending more than every other military on the planet combined and is involved in more war and more death and more suffering than every other nation combined and yet it's sitting there on a pedestal talking about other nations developing weapons of mass destruction it is insane that we even allow them to do this the first nation that needs to disarm without question is the United States and the first nation to be charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity is the United States. Once we start seeing actions like this, then we'll know that people in positions of power are serious because ultimately the rest of the world is sick and tired of the impunity and the continuous threats of a third world war. So we've reached a point now where human beings around the planet are realizing we can't do this. We can't have a third world war. This is not a game. Okay. I think that every nation should disarm right now. 
every nation that has a weapons program should be inspected by a legitimate international body and those nations with the highest amount of weapons of mass destruction nuclear weapons are the first ones to start disarming and when those nations start disarming then I would say that the rest of the world will also have to show that it's disarming as well but while the United States is able to maintain the largest military might in the history of this world and continues to use those weapons against all of the countries I only see it as a pure hypocrisy that the West would say that other countries can't have such things I don't want any weapons in this world, but it's not right for us in the West, in particular the United States, to say that we can have all these weapons and the rest of the world will bomb you to the Stone Age if you even try to think to defend yourself. It's beyond hypocrisy. It's ridiculous. The U.S. needs to disarm first, mm -hmm. and the world needs to insist on that. Now, I've read in your blog that you said this world needs one thing about all others, and that's sanity. But doesn't sanity depend on what side of the argument you're on? No, I think we were all sane when we were children, and unfortunately what passes as education is actually indoctrination, and through indoctrination we've turned into largely a bunch of dupes who've enslaved ourselves without even knowing it. But when you regain the capacity to think for yourself, to actually become human, it becomes very clear. For instance, if we look at these politicians who historically lied to us over and over and over again, and we realize that the war-making industries are, are absolutely inherently interested in perpetuating war, and if we we look at the people in positions of power and we see how they continuously reap major bonuses with the banks, they get bailouts to the tune of trillions, and yet we're being told that we're not working hard enough, that we're in debt. All of these things combined lead us to a point where we reach a certain level of sanity and realize, you know what? This entire system does not represent me, and in fact, every single person on this planet is fighting the same enemy. And that enemy uses the financial system to enslave all of us. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. In fact, more and more people are figuring this out. And a point of sanity brings us to a point where we realize, enough, this is a game that cannot be played. We're risking our own collective suicide here. And as a sane person, I will not contribute in any way towards this never-ending policy of war, which is leading us to the brink of, destru of, mm -hmm. of destruction. And this is, not a, this is not about being intelligent, this is about being sane first and foremost. The average person can understand this very easily. I know that you have renounced U.S. citizenship more than twice, three times I think, right? So having a U.S. passport is a dream for so many people. What's so wrong with it? I mean, you don't have to agree with U.S. policies, but is America all that bad? When you look at citizenship, you have to understand that citizenship is a contract. It's a social contract between the state and the citizen. Under that contract, you have supposedly rights and you also have obligations. Now, I looked at the obligations of being a U.S. citizen and I realized I cannot pay into a tax system, which is mostly paying off, which basically paying off debt to the bankers. But nonetheless, we pay into a tax system, which is used to produce military capability which is ultimately killing my brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. I do not agree to contributing to a tax system that is being used to commit mass murder against people I consider to be my brothers and sisters halfway around the world. It's a violation of my ethics as a man, as someone who believes in, in justice for everyone and wants a better world for everyone. I cannot pay for the murder of my brother or sister. And that's part of the contract of citizenship. So I said, which was to me a sensible thing and a moral thing to do, take my name off of that contract because I do not agree to it and ultimately I will walk away. And I left a paradise life in Hawaii. I had my own business. I was making money, lived on the beach, did something I loved. You know, I loved, I had a beautiful, beautiful life, and I walked from that because I absolutely 100% disagree with the actions of my Burke Nation and find them so criminal that I need my name to be taken off that list. I will enter into a contract again with the United States if indeed it carries itself with honor and will respect the U.S. Constitution. If the U.S. Constitution is indeed made the supreme law of the United States, then I will happily come back to my nation and, and adhere to the contract. I would argue probably the reason why they have not honored my right of self-determination, a human right of self-determination, is because it could set a precedent which could uh, spark an imaginative idea that people could look at around the world and say, you know what, I don't actually agree with this contract with my nation any longer. I want to enter into a new contract. This is why I refer to myself as a world citizen. We're all world citizens. My human family is where my allegiance goes. I don't give my allegiance to one unit, one group, one nation, one religion. My whole human family is a brother and sister, and ultimately I give my my allegiance to them. That's the contract I will honor. And if any other contract inferior to that one would try to compel me to pay for the murder of my brother or sister, I will not, I will not partake in that contract. I will not pay into the UK tax system and fund the murder of my brothers and sisters halfway around the world. I simply refuse to do it. And I would argue that other people should look at a contract like that. And maybe if we all decide to enter into a new contract like that, we can end war for good.
So you say you're a world citizen. Is there any place that you love more than others? Why are you living in the UK if you don't like UK policies? I love Hawaii. My adopted homeland is Hawaii, and the Hawaiian nation was stolen by the United States in 1893. And yet, there are my Hawaiian brothers and sisters who are Hawaiian nationals and who know who they are and have not forgotten who they are and take pride in who they are. And if if they have their way and I have my way, the Hawaiian nation will no longer be a military outpost for the United States, launching its wars of aggression against everybody. The latest boogeyman. Hawaii is the place that I long to live. I plan to return there, but I want the empire out of Hawaii. Hawaii is not an extension of. The U.S. Empire. It is a Hawaiian nation, and the people of Hawaii, the Kanaka Maoli, deserve to have their nation back.